the holiday season officially ends today, which is the 12th day of Christmas, known as the Feast of the Epiphany, or Three Kings Day. It's the festival of the revelation of Jesus. God made flesh that walked among us. It is a revelation because this is the point when people outside of Jesus' immediate family, his parents, understand the importance of his birth. And the wise ones who follow the star are often referred to as the three kings or the wise ones. In truth, they were neither kings or wise men. They were really Zoroastrian priests, which is important because, let me get this right, Zoroastrianism is the world's oldest monotheistic religion. So no, they weren't Jewish, certainly weren't Christian, they weren't even Muslim. These were priests, and they earned the title of wise men because of their skill in interpreting dreams and understanding astrology, as well as telling fortunes and preparing daily horoscopes. They were the scholars of their day. And Matthew tells us that these priests followed the star of Bethlehem to Jesus' birthplace. This was to ensure the ancient audience who was hearing this story that Jesus was the fulfillment not only of the Old Testament prophecy, but also in the Zoroastrian faith, their virgin birth prophecy as well. Now we have pictured these three wise men in many different ways. And in a more contemporary context, they have been depicted as coming from different continents to show the universality of Christ, the gospel, and the church. Now that universal depiction acknowledges that wisdom can come from all ends of the earth. And that's very important in a time when border crossing is increasingly dangerous and politicized. That universal depiction of the three wise men coming from different corners of the earth acknowledges that wisdom can come from everywhere. It means a lot in a time when those with different customs and ways are increasingly demonized by polarizing politics. That universal depiction that wisdom can come from all ends of the earth means a lot in a time when our culture is being drained of its empathy and civility at the speed of light. So here we have these holy men, these priests, these astronomers who follow the sign to the hope that God is being born among us. So I think it's worth noting how the story of the wise men in Matthew and also the angels and the shepherds in Luke takes place not in colorful, colorful splendor or a picturesque desert scene, but it takes place in the politics of domination and costly resistance to it. Now I know a lot of us have grown, grown up with the standard Christian interpretation that has made this story an intense tale of inner spirituality. You know, Jesus came to save our souls, not our bodies. How silently, silently sings one of our carols, so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. Now, I, I understand why a lot of people want to interpret the gospel that way, but I want to confess to you that I distrust this oversimplified, watered-down, non-threatening, non-transformative, theological fall de rock. Because such theological dodging leaves injustice untouched. Just as long as we all get to heaven. 
the Messiah enters the world and his family and his clan in the city of Bethlehem suffer violence and murder. Now, interpreters sometimes demonstrate their promise as scholars by pointing out that we have no record of the slaughter that the Bible tells us about, that King Herod was so determined to stop the Christ that he issued a decree that all male children be murdered. And some interpreters say that we have no record of such a slaughter. I would argue that such tone-deaf interpretation ignores the normalization of violence in human life. So we may not have a particular record of this particular slaughter, but one thing we know, that children are killed every day, especially on the margins, especially in those poor, overlooked, want to be forgotten places. One thing we know that we do go to war gladly, even on our streets. And a lot of violence happens just to maintain the status quo, and people do follow evil dictates. The story that we hear in Matthew knows this, and this is the context that our Messiah has been born, in the middle of all of that. <coughs> and when we place this biblical story in its real historical context, the arrival of the Magi in Jerusalem signaled an upsetting of political equilibrium, or at least the pretense of it, and calling into question the rule of an insecure puppet king and insecure, overly sensitive, and abrasive royal person. And you know, when you have a ruler that is insecure, overly sensitive, and wills excessive power, and has the resources to back it up, you have, my friends, a dangerous combination. Amen. <laughs> dangerous to all who offer any type of threat or challenge. So this king, Donald Herod, they call him the Herod. <laughs> well, when he thinks it just might be true that someone is born who will be able to overthrow him, that there is someone born who might be able to give the people some hope, and that hope might cause people to resist to protest. <coughs> he uses all his power to make sure it doesn't happen. No, this king, the Herod, doesn't just want to build a wall to those who would threaten him. He responds with a murderous rage and signals all the male children be killed. For if they are eliminated, his threat, he thinks, is eliminated. Now this doesn't sound so crazy when you think about it. Because we've seen this mindset in our own time. When you have four and five year olds seen as a threat because of their social location, seen only as predators in the making, not as children. And so the Holy Family found themselves as refugees on the run. This story tells us that the deadly politics that led to Jesus' death were present the day he was born. Yet we have these star followers from the East they arrive even though they are political dangers of worshiping a criminalized baby messiah. They arrive at the home where Jesus and Mary are and they don't see a predator in the making. They don't see someone to feed the prison complex of Rome 
all they see is a reflection of the holy, and they bring gifts. And they don't question whether Jesus needs these gifts. They don't do an assessment of his parents' worth, although the parents clearly bear the markings of what we would call being in need or underprivileged. They don't ask to see their birth certificates or green cards. They simply kneel before Jesus and offer their gifts, gold, to honor him as a king, myrrh as to one who was mortal, and incense that they would send to God. These gifts show that the Magi, they get Jesus. They understand who he is, who he will grow to be, and so they come to honor him. They honor him as a way of honoring God. So today is the festival of the Epiphany, and we have moved from a season of indulgence and consuming and gift-giving to today, a celebration marked to honor not ourselves, not our family, not just the people we love, but our God. And when I was thinking about this, it caused me to ask myself, what would it look like if we gave gifts of honor to those that the powers that be deem unworthy of life itself? This is a time to ask ourselves about the gifts we give when we give a gift. Do people know when we give them that we see promise in them? Do people know by the gifts that we give that we see a spark of God in them? I mean, what would those type of gifts look like? What would they sound like? What would that smell like? The gift giving of the Magi gives us a direction in our gift giving, a way to make every part of our lives individually and corporately a witness of hope in and for a broken, despairing world. For like the world into which Jesus was born, ours is a world of political and economic oppression, of homelessness, and forced immigration of violence and fear mongering. So here's the thing. The Herod did all he could to stop the move of God into our world. And the story of the Magi and the Epiphany is a message of warning of those who are trying to stop the flow of God's gracious and liberating work in our world. This story is good news to those innocents who are being slaughtered. It is good news to those who rebel or rebel against tyranny. For here in this story, the Bible tells us that you can do whatever you want. You can pull any strings you want. You can even commit any atrocity you want, but you will not win. That's the good news. Because hope even in the midst of all of that, will be born anyway. And the wise ones will follow the light and that combination that will make a way out of no way. So be encouraged, but watch for the sign that God is with and among us. Whether the light of the epiphany encourages us to be more welcoming of those who are traveling across borders, or shows the cruelty of rulers who abuse children in the name of politics, 
whether the light of the epiphany encourages us to bring our minds and souls together with others that have a singular commitment to God, or helps us to be more appreciative and understanding of those with different religious traditions than our own. This story tells us that they can show us a way as well. The light of the epiphany beckons us, let us be wise enough to follow it. So may the light of the epiphany lead us to hope. May the light of the epiphany compel us not to follow the dictates of evil rulers. May it lead us to hope. May it lead us to go another way. And may it shine all the more brightly on all of us who are able to encounter it. Amen. Amen.